welcome everybody here this afternoon. I'm your moderator. Uh, my name is Jessica Cushion. I'm from the Victoria Law Foundation, which is a, 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 um, a not-for-profit organisation in Victoria that focuses on research, education, and we give out grants as well in the area of access to justice and civil legal issues. Our first presenter today is Professor Ho Zhang from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, assistant professor there. And he's going to speak today on interactions with students in a hybrid and virtual teaching environment, lessons learned and moving forward. Now, as we know, each presenter has 15 to 20 minutes for their presentation, followed by five minutes of questions. And you'll get a message from the admins in your chat box if you go over time. Okay, over to you, thank you. Well, thank you, Chair, for the very kind introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope that everybody can see my screen here. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, so very much for having me as part of this very informative and thought provoking uh, conference on teaching and learning in law. As Dr. Kutin just introduced, my name is uh, Hao Zhang. I'm assistant professor at the CUHK Law. Um, so today I'm going to share with you some of my initial experiences of uh, using interactive tools to facilitate uh, engagement and also interactions with uh, students uh, in the hybrid and virtual learning uh, environment. As a relatively um, junior faculty member at CUHK Law, I really have uh, put in a lot of uh, thoughts and efforts to design uh, interactions uh, in the online teaching environment. Um, I think the um, online teaching, hybrid teaching, um, have, have really presented a lot of opportunities and also challenges uh, over the past uh, two years since the pandemic started. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce uh, the two courses uh, based on which uh, my experiences are uh, built up. I really have um, putting a lot of efforts at designing uh, those uh, interact, uh, interactions uh, through teaching, especially for those two courses, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the student body um, as well as uh, some of the features um, of those courses. Um, then I'm going to uh, briefly uh, talk about why interactions matter. I think this is quite a, a well known fact that interactions are quite important uh, for law teaching. And then I'm going to look at the interactive tools I um, extensively used over the past uh, two years. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to um, share with you uh, the student feedback as well as some uh, self-reflections. Um, I really have to say that those uh, two courses, uh, which I'm going to uh, rely on, um, which will be the basis for this presentation, are quite unique because those two courses are really designed um, for each of the Master of Laws programs uh, here at the CHK Law. Um, that being said, I think some of the reflections I have got uh, can be easily transferable because I think interactions are really useful tools um, to actually um, understand students' learning outcomes as well as to improve uh, teaching techniques. Because I think, uh, especially for me, uh, I'm still actively uh, learning about how to be uh, an efficient and also um, effective uh, law teacher. Um, also, I just really want to declare that um, I just have recovered from COVID. Um, I might have to cough in the middle of my presentation, so my apologies uh, in advance. So the two courses um, that I have uh, had the pleasure um, of teaching at the CHK Law uh, are Chinese Contract Law, which is a compulsory course for the Chinese Business Law uh, program at the postgraduate level. Uh, the other course is uh, Chinese Energy Law, uh, which is also highly relevant to my research area. Chinese Energy Law is an elective course for the Master of Laws program in Energy and Environmental Law. I'm also in charge of that Master of Laws program um, over the past uh, a few years. So that program is relatively new and the Chinese Energy Law has been designed uh, more specifically as an elective to actually attract students from the LEL program. So both courses um, are taught in English language. Uh, the delivery mode um, is lectures. 
So because we don't really have tutorials, uh, interactions actually uh, even more important uh, to engage students through uh, the lectures to understand their learning outcomes as well as to improve some of the uh, uh, lecture contents. So the student body and also their uh, pre-existing knowledge um, about the subject matters uh, really vary significantly uh, between these two uh, courses. For Chinese contract law, um, this course, I have seen actually a higher number, <coughs> excuse me, of non mainland Chinese uh, students. Uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, local students from Hong Kong, as well as um, some international students as well. Uh, those students have uh, almost like zero knowledge about uh, Chinese contract law. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, quite a few students from in China. Uh, all of those uh, Chinese men and students have studied uh, Chinese contract law before through the undergrad program uh, that they have received uh, in mainland China. So here, as you can see, we have a really a mix of students uh, with different levels of understandings about the subject matters. Um, and also uh, their expectations are quite different in terms of what they are going to learn through this course. So that really uh, presents a lot of uh, challenges for me as a course teacher to design uh, the course content and also to uh, facilitate their interactions through in-class activities. For Chinese energy law, which is a relatively uh, new course, uh, so this course has a mixed students from uh, both the LLM program and also the Drew's Doctor program because it is an elective open to all uh, postgraduate students. Uh, majority of the students are from mainland China uh, because um, this course is actually more useful perhaps for some of them who are very keen to practice in this area of law uh, in the greater China uh, region. Um, majority, again, majority of the students uh, have very little knowledge about um, energy law, not to mention Chinese energy law. So um, as a course teacher, I really have to cover a lot of very basic knowledge and concepts about energy law and also the energy law development uh, in China as well. Um, regarding the second issue, why interactions really matter, um, clearly I think the online uh, teaching, hybrid teaching um, are really um, sort of like challenging a new teaching environment for um, all of us. At the CHQ Law, the online teaching commenced in semester two of academic year 2019 to 2020. Um, and then after that, we had a um, sort of like the, the mix of hybrid and online teaching uh, during academic year 2020 to uh, 21, depends on the uh, pandemic situation in Hong Kong. So for last semester, uh, because the pandemic situation in Hong Kong was pretty much under control, we were very fortunate to have 100% face-to-face uh, -face, uh, teaching. So for me, uh, the challenges were really that for uh, especially students from mainland China and also from local Hong Kong, uh, they're really shy, they're very reluctant, uh, for example, to turn on their camera so you can't really see their faces. Um, and also very few students are willing to uh, speak up and also share their uh, thoughts. I spoke to some of them in private about the reasons why they're so reluctant. Um, I think those uh, reasons, I think, are pretty much uh, common uh, across quite a few uh, different jurisdictions. Um, I think, especially for me, uh, the biggest challenge was really uh, how to engage them uh, through teaching. So I think interactions here play uh, two very important roles. Uh, first of all, uh, it is a very important uh, means to have more engaging and also attractive uh, learning environment. Um, and also for me, um, it is also a very vital uh, tool to uh, collect feedback uh, on students' learning outcomes throughout the course uh, so that I can actually improve or even, for, for instance, repeat some of the uh, key issues that uh, I have uh, covered. So regarding the uh, interactive tools that I have used, uh, first of all, uh, let me just quickly share with you the rationale behind 
uh, comparing to some of other colleagues uh, at CHK Law who are very uh, driven by technology, new technology, I'm not very good at uh, technology um, at all. So the uh, first criteria for me when choosing uh, interactive tools um, is about the fact that the tools must be very easy uh, to use. The interface will be very uh, user-friendly to navigate. And also um, because I really use the interactive tools to uh, present the questions and I hope the presentations of the questions through the interactive tools can be very clear. Um, and also uh, the functions or the functionality of that um, interactive tools, I hope they will be very diverse. Uh, for instance, um, Zoom polling, I'm pretty sure most of you have used that before. Zoom polling basically allows single choices, multiple choices, and I want diverse sort of like uh, question times to be allowed through that interactive tool. And also feedback um, also is a very important uh, selection uh, criteria. So over the past two years, I have really tried uh, quite a few different uh, interactive tools, including Zoom polling, uh, eReply. So eReply is actually developed by CUHK uh, in collaboration with universities in Hong Kong. I'm going to uh, share with you some of the examples of using eReply as a very uh, useful interactive tool. Um, like others have also used uh, Zoom breakout rooms because uh, breakout rooms will be very uh, convenient for students to actually to know each other uh, because they don't really have the chance to actually meet each other face to face. I've also used Google Docs, uh, Blackboard, especially the, uh, the, the forum function to facilitate communications. But based on my experiences, um, I really have chosen uh, two very important uh, tools here. The first one is Zoom polling. Uh, Zoom polling provides some very, uh, very basic functions here, uh, single multiple choices. The reason why I think Zoom polling is useful because it really allows anonymous um, feedback from students and also it really provides some instant and quick collection of uh, students' feedback to quizzes and also questions. So I have some examples here I can share with you uh, later on. The second tool I have used very extensively is uh, eReply. eReply is very useful because it really gives students the choices of uh, inputting their uh, names or student ID or not. So they do have the choices of revealing their identity or not based on their preferences. And also eReply contains more sophisticated uh, question types. Uh, you can do multiple choices. Uh, answering text or uh, filling the blanks. So here is a, a Zoom polling question example. Um, so the three questions here are basically survey questions I uh, often use in the first lecture. So these are examples from the Chinese energy law course. Uh, as you can see, the questions here are pretty much designed to break the initial ice and also to um, understand uh, students' knowledge about the subject matters, as well as their preferences uh, regarding the use of uh, breakout rooms. So those are really sort of like the basic uh, functions Zoom polling uh, provides. Uh, in the meantime, I have also used Zoom polling to actually um, test students' knowledge and their understanding about the subject matters. Here, as you can see, uh, my apologies for the very small font because I just really want to give you like a full picture about the complicated questions I can present using uh, Zoom polling. So here, each of the question basically covers some of the very important uh, lecture topics uh, which I discussed uh, in the lectures. And also I tend to use uh, Zoom polling uh, questions to review what we covered uh, in the previous week to actually uh, warm students up and also prepare their minds for uh, teaching. Uh, you reply here um, is also a really extremely useful tool. Uh, the example here um, is from the Chinese contract law course. Uh, as you can see, the interface here, uh, this is basically the uh, interface students can see. So they can uh, use either use their phone to scan the QR code, uh, which I think is very user friendly, uh, or they can put in the URL 
and then a session number uh, by opening up, uh, opening an internet browser. So your reply here uh, can be used to actually uh, test students' knowledge about some of the very complicated issues here. So the example here is from the Chinese contract law course when I talk about conditions in conditional contract. So this is a very specific uh, examples that you reply can be used. Um, so here, this uh, slide pre uh, presents uh, the feedback from students. So the feedback is really instant. And also I often encourage them to uh, putting their names or student ID so that I can understand uh, their learning uh, outcomes. And your reply can also be used to present more complicated questions. So here is a case analysis when I talk about modifications of uh, trans modifications or transfer of contract, uh, students can be given longer time to actually type in the answer using text. Um, and then the report generated by the reply is extremely useful where I can actually see which student has answered uh, in what way. And then I can really provide feedback based on this. So regarding the students' feedbacks, um, I have uh, basically summarized the feedbacks uh, in three general uh, points. So the feedback is based on the uh, course and teaching evaluation in term one, uh, academic, academic year 2020 to 2021, 20, uh, when we had 100% uh, online teaching. So I think, first of all, the feedback really emphasized the importance of respecting students' willingness to speak. Uh, as I mentioned before, some of them are really shy. They're not willing to uh, speak up. Once in a while, you have some very active students who are very willing to speak. But then the problem uh, is that some other students might feel like they're being ignored or uh, neglected. So I think using inter interactive tools uh, allows universal uh, feedback from uh, students. Uh, the second uh, feedback uh, really uh, focuses on using the online features uh, to motivate them to contribute uh, in the class, uh, which is really helpful for them to stay focused and engaged on Zoom. Um, the final feedback um, is really about consolidate uh, their understanding about some of the very uh, technical uh, concepts. So this is particularly the case for uh, Chinese uh, energy law course. So some uh, very initial reflections because I think I'm really running out of time. So I think the interactive tools are very uh, versatile um, because I think for Chinese contract law, uh, most students expect to learn something new or to be challenged. Uh, so I have really used uh, e-reply to actually present more complicated questions to test their knowledge. Uh, for Chinese energy law, because most students find it very difficult to understand concepts uh, which are technical. So I really have used as in polling uh, the basic functions of you reply to review those concepts uh, very often and also to consolidate their understanding. As I mentioned before, for the past semester, we had 100% face to face because I, I can't really use Zoom polling, any, Zoom polling questions anymore. So I really have transformed some of those questions uh, into you reply questions or just present those questions on the slides. Uh, and I think the thinking process here um, is very important. And also the general reflection is that uh, students are more motivated uh, when they uh, feel re being respected and also when they are reminded to take ownership of their learning. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions or take on any comments you may have. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Hao. That was very interesting. I, I realise you brought back some early um, COVID online teaching traumas for me. So I'm trying to get students to engage and it's good to hear about how you used all the methods you could possibly use to get that engagement with your students because I don't know about you and other people, but certainly at the start of COVID, you kind of felt like you were just talking to your computer and nobody was listening. So it's good. We've got a couple of questions. So I'll go to the first question first and that's from uh, Samuel Yarush Shalmi and his question is I want to ask you is it according to you the pandemic indicated 
advantages of hybrid and virtual forms of education? And do you think that these kind of forms of education and teaching have a big future in post-COVID era too? Well, I think the general answer is yes. Um, I think over the past few years, even before the pandemic started, I think universities really emphasize uh, online teaching um, as a way to actually benefit society, not just within the university, but also the society uh, more broadly. So I think some of the knowledges that professors will have or teachers will have, will have a broader impact through online uh, teaching. So I think here at the CHK Law, uh, some of my colleagues are really actively uh, developing some of the modules, right? So online modules, which are free to all. So I think that's the sort of like the basic form of online teaching. Uh, but I think the uh, interactions, right, with uh, either through Zoom or other online uh, teaching platform will be actually even more useful because you can have actually interaction, real-time interactions with uh, others, which are far away from you. So I think the general answer is yes. Yeah. Right. I've got a question here from um, Marie Hadley, who is also speaking next. Um, did you find the use of tools disruptive to the flow of the class? Well, initially, uh, yes. Uh, for the simple reason that, because um, I think it's all about preparation. Um, the reason why I emphasize uh, the uh, tools that I have selected must be very easy to use because I try other tools. For instance, the more uh, sophisticated version of UReply, there are so many commercial uh, online platforms you can use, which requires subscription, but they have like more colors. The presentation is more attractive. But then the problem is, it's really difficult to navigate. And that can be really disruptive. So the reason why I've, I've chosen you reply because it's very basic, but it really provides all the functions that I need. And then, uh, so it depends on how you design the questions. So those questions, I think for me, uh, really facilitate uh, teaching and also review some of the concepts which are covered or even just like test the knowledge. Because uh, for example, for the Chinese contract law, I really have to cover some of the basic concepts. But then the contract law itself is so extensive, I can only really focus on the general principles, some of the general provisions, um, but then some of the very uh, niche points that I want to cover, I think those can be better conveyed through, for instance, uh, you reply questions instead of me uh, talking about those concepts to make sure that they're all still there and listening and paying attention as well. Uh, Marie had also a follow-up question and um, was, I'm not quite sure whether uh, she asks, was the use of the tools mandatory? I don't know whether it was mandatory for the, I can see that. And did the, like, did some students just ignore it and not answer the questions or was there an expectation that they had to use the tools and answer those questions that you gave them? Basically, I think it's a question mm -hmm. about response rate, right? That's right, yes. Um, I'm not sure if you actually pay attention to the slides. Um, so I think my experience, yeah, my, well, I do have some, I think there was indication of the response rate. Yeah, I think uh, there was one where there was 55 responses, yeah. That's right, yes. Uh, yeah. So something I didn't mention is for the class size, for both of the classes, I've got 70 students in a class. So it's actually full size. Um, so I think overall, the response rate is really high because I really emphasize to them that it is voluntary, but it is important for me to understand your learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. And also it's very easy for them, for instance, Zoom polling, right? Just like a few clicks using the mouse. So I think it's actually very easy uh, for them. And also it's anonymous. They don't feel like they're judged. Uh, your reply is slightly more complicated because I do, I do emphasize to them that if you put in your student, your name and ID, um, I would know who you are, but it's confidential. It's only available to me as a course teacher. Well, so, yeah, so in the context of your le lectures, the students responding to your use of those tools was voluntary. And I think I also like know of another university in Melbourne where online teaching, the students were required was part of their assessment to provide at least three responses to like a mm. blog or an issue or some kind of platform like that. But thank you so much for your presentation today. And we'll move on now to the next um, speakers.
So the next uh, presentation is by Dr. Marie Hadley and Dr. Donna McNamara of the University of Newcastle in, now I've forgotten whether it's Australia or the, uh, the UK, they, they can correct me when, I was gonna make a note about that, but I forgot, but anyway. Now, um, their topic is connecting through creativity in the pandemic virtual classroom a flat Stanley project for law students. Now I know my son's read a couple of those flat Stanley books. I'll be interested to hear how you've woven that into your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I am confirming that we are University of Newcastle in Australia, <laughs> as you may be able to tell. <laughs> no, I thought so because when my colleagues were going, oh, is that, oh, are they, are they Aussies as well? Or is that Newcastle, Newcastle? No, no, no. Okay, okay, I'll stop now. Thank you. <laughs> No, you're right. I'll just share my um, my screen properly. I'll start my show. Okay, great. I'll get started. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, Hal, for such a very interesting presentation. Um, as someone who teaches online, I'm very impressed by a 55 out of 70 student response rate to anything that is not accessible. So, <laughs> well, well done with that. All right. So. Um, good evening, everyone. Today, Donna and I will be talking to you about an interactive um, intervention that we introduced in the context of our contract law and health law classes towards the end of last year. So this intervention, which was a flat Stanley project for law students, was essentially an attempt to support student wellbeing uh, during the pandemic and foster greater engagement and better morale in our online synchronous classes. So at our university, the University of Newcastle in Australia, semester two of 2021 was held wholly online. So around the start of semester, Sydney, our closest major city, went into a long lockdown. About a month later, Newcastle, where we live and work, went into a three month lockdown. During this time, children were homeschooled, we were confined to our homes and unable to have visitors, and we needed to stay within our local government area or a five kilometre radius for food shopping and exercise. So for us as teachers, as well as our students, this was a time of isolation, monotony, and also burnout. During the semester, Donna and I were both teaching and we noticed student engagement dipping significantly in our online classes as the weeks went on. By the mid-semester break, we'd have up to 50 students online at any one time, but maybe only five and on a good day 10 uh, students typing in the chat or asking or answering questions. Uh, this made classes very difficult and also very tiring for us, um, but it was also concerning with regards to where the mental health of our students might be at and also how they were tracking with regards to their progression towards learning outcomes and skills development and perhaps their lack of engagement in class was a sign of a disconnection from the course at large. And then one day my son's kindergarten teacher mailed me a flat Stanley project for him to complete as part of his weekly homeschooling activities. Flat Stanley projects are inspired by the children's book Flat Stanley by Jeff Brown. In the book, Stanley is squashed flat one night while he is sleeping. He decides to make the most of being flat and he goes on a number of adventures, uh, including visiting his friends by mailing himself in an envelope. Now, since the 1990s, Flat Stanley projects have been used in primary schools and high schools as a way for teachers to connect with their students and support a learning exercise. There have also been a few Flat Stanley projects used around the world in the university context too. Um, but these typically involve connecting the university to primary school students rather than being used internally by educators for their tertiary students. In any case, a flat Stanley project involves taking a laminated or paper version of the teacher, usually their cartoon avatar, on an adventure and undertaking an associated literacy project. So this is what my son's teacher had done. And as a result, my son and I ended up taking his flat teacher on an adventure all around our garden. We were looking for things that rhymed with his spelling words and we were taking photographs and making videos. 
And it was actually really fun. And I enjoyed it as much as he did. So the next time I touched base with Nonna, I mentioned to her how much fun I'd had doing this flat Stanley project. And then Donna and I thought, well, could we not do something like this for our law students? We ultimately decided to create a flat Stanley project in the form of a photography contest and wellbeing activity. While perhaps a little bit out of the ordinary, uh, our interest in organizing an activity like this was not wholly unexpected. In the past, we've both set creative assessments in our law subjects. Donna had been involved in research that underpinned an art exhibition, and I would run a photo contest amongst staff as part of our annual teaching and learning day. So even though it seemed a little bit silly to do a flat Stanley project, given our students are a whole lot bigger than my six-year-old son, uh, we thought it might have possible positive effects for students in terms of letting them know that we in the university cared about them, or at minimum, at least make them laugh when they opened up their mail. And then the more we looked into it, the more we realised that there is research that supports a close relationship between creativity, productivity and well-being. And we became more hopeful that the contest would support student well-being and productivity and with any luck have the byproduct of more engagement in our classes. In terms of practical matters, we saw internal funding for the printing and laminating costs because our building was actually closed at the time, so we didn't have any access to printers or laminators. Um, and we also sought funding for a prize pool for the best photographs. And we were lucky enough to receive support from our head of school in this regard. We then called for our students to opt into the activity. And then we posted those volunteer students a laminated cartoon avatar of ourselves. Um, and we asked them to document student life in the pandemic by taking photographs of their adventures, of their adventures, sorry, with their flat lecturers. And the poem that we sent them along with our laminated cartoon avatars um, is on the slide here. We also provided a download, uh, sorry, a download at home version on our course pages in case any students decided to join in later on. We set up the photo contest through a low cost website called Poll Unit, and it cost only US $10 uh, for a month of access. And students could then access the, that website through a QR code or a, a URL. Um, and then they could upload their submissions directly through the portal. When the entry period closed, we could also use that poll unit site to allow for public voting on the photographs. In terms of participation in this activity, the uptake was sound, but it wasn't overwhelming. So we budgeted our laminating and our postage costs uh, based on about 40 students being involved, um, which was out of a combined total of 200 students that semester. Ultimately, 37 students opted in to receive the materials via post, and we ended up with 53 entries to the competition. One of the things that was quite interesting though, was that we had a number of students as well as members of the public join in on the voting uh, approximately 200 people voted for the People's Choice Award. Outside of having a People's Choice um, Award, we also had three random um, prize draws, two Lecturer's Choice Awards, where Donna and I both chose our favourite picture from our cohorts, and the dog on the slide here, whose name is Frankie. Frankie Dog won my category. And uh, there was also an award for the best overall photograph, uh, which we'll show you right at the end of our presentation. And the winners received a gift card of their choice. So having talked to you about what we did and why we did it, Donna will now run through some of the outcomes of our flat lecture project and also the implications that we see as arising from it uh, for the teaching of law more generally. Thank you, Donna. Thanks, Marie. Um, so our students are drawn from a very diverse cohort in Newcastle. 
We have a large amount of first and family students, a number of our students attending from neighbouring regional areas of up to four to five hours away, and many, if not most, work in part-time jobs to support their living expenses while at uni. And also a number of our students, both, both postgraduate and undergraduate, are juggling family or caring responsibilities. So on top of the diversity of our cohort itself, the Newcastle region is also very geographically diverse. Our law school campus in the CBD is located one street from the port, which I believe is the largest coal port in the world. Um, our campus is located in the CBD along a beautiful stretch of coastline that features a number of beautiful beaches. And about half an hour south is a large lake. Half an hour to the west is the Hunter Valley wine region, and then further out is a number of rural farming and coastal towns. So one of the key outcomes of our flat lecture project was simply being able to see that sheer diversity of the imagery that was sent through in the competition, and that captured something of the range of student experiences during the pandemic, and also the variety in the scenery um, within and around the Newcastle area itself in circumstances where a lot of the students from the country had actually returned back to their family homes for the semester. So the photographs really showcased our local area and made us appreciate more fully where our students were and what they were up to, from skateboarding along the paths at the beach, to birthing lambs on a rural property, to studying by their pool at home with their pets. Now, in terms of student well-being outcomes, we did not systematically set this up as a research project. As Marie mentioned, the idea came from a conversation that we had had, and we put the project together over the scope of a week. So it was quite quick, and ultimately ethics approval for a project such as this would have taken a minimum of three months, by which time the semester would have been over. So without ethics approval, we did not have the opportunity to reliably capture data around the impacts of the project on students themselves and whether it did indeed improve their well-being or productivity levels. However, our informal data that we gathered does support that it was a positive experience for our students. We received emails thanking us for running the project and those students who participated seemed to have fun. The People's Choice Awards data also supports engagements from students outside of the direct participants themselves, and I'll return to this shortly. So in terms of engagement in classes itself, it's also hard to measure this outside of a formal research project as to whether we achieved our aim in gathering our students back in and in connecting them more closely with our classes and with each other. However, what we did notice was that running this competition and receiving the photographs actually improved our own well-being as teachers in these courses. And remember, we were also in lockdown too and teaching into the void, which was incredibly draining for the duration of an entire semester. So we found that featuring the competition entries on our PowerPoint slides and publicizing the competition and letting the students know that we were impressed with their entries and the quality of them, that made us feel good and we were able to take that additional energy into our classes, which we would argue then lightened the mood independently of any direct benefits also received to the students who participated in the project. If we were to rerun, rerun an exercise like this, we would seek ethical approval to undertake qualitative research, and we would think it would be worthwhile to seek to capture data on well-being and productivity from the perspective of students as research participants, as well as data from the student participants about their experience in the project as well. Our project also had some less anticipated outcomes as well. The first involved the uptake by our undergraduate and postgraduate students who are parents. And this perhaps should not have been a surprise to us, given that we are both aware that quite a lot of our students have children. But we did not anticipate that our student parents would be such enthusiastic volunteers in the project, given that most of them were homeschooling on top of studying and working online. Um, but in fact, these were they were quite typically the first students to put their name down for the competition. And there were also the students who reached out after the competition had finished and told us how much they enjoyed it as they took the family outside for their exercise time. And it essentially gave them a fun family activity that they could all do together. 
Some students also mentioned to us that their children were also doing a flat teacher project as well as a homeschooling activity at the same time. So their children's flat teachers were able to go on these adventures with their flat lecturer as well. So um, there's something really nice about that as it positioned education as a shared experience between our students and their children. And I think this form of activity that was conducive to family time also brings to the fore this idea that certain types of learning activities are potentially more inclusive of a wider range of personal circumstances than others. The second less anticipated outcome concerned social media engagement. Now, as part of the competition, we encouraged our students to share their photographs to Twitter and tag us in the pictures alongside the hashtag flat lecture. In some ways, this was not super successful as many of our students didn't actually have a Twitter account. But as we publicized the competition more in class and as the deadline for entries got closer, we did have a few students jumping on board and sharing their imagery, as well as some students commenting on their friends' imagery. Also, as part of the terms and conditions of the project, we had received permission from students for us to share their photographs on our own personal social media accounts. And we progressively did this more as the voting for the People's Choice of Awards was opened up. And sharing some of the photographs online, along with a couple of LinkedIn and Twitter posts, actually generated a decent amount of public interest from within the broader student population itself, but also strangers to our, uh, to our university. And facilitating that connection between our law school and the university and the broader public was quite a positive experience. We felt quite proud of our students and of our region, and the, phot the photographs really show off the Newcastle area quite nicely. Ultimately, while the uptake of students themselves choosing to share their own photographs remained quite limited, there was quite a lot of social media interest from the posts that we did. And you can see on the table on the slide that we had something like 830 engagements on our Twitter posts um, with the imagery that we shared. So to us, this shows that a flat Stanley project like this is different enough and interesting enough that it can have a public facing side to it that can facilitate connection between a law school and the university and its broader community. So in thinking about the implications of our Flat Stanley project for the teaching of law more generally, we see the, our, our experience with this project as having potential significance for two key areas. So the first is for distance learning. Fostering engagement and a sense of online connection in our online classes, whether they are synchronous or asynchronous, is a difficult task, as no doubt we have all found over the past two years. But perhaps using a flat lecture or project as an icebreaker could help connect students to each other in an online cohort and help capture their engagement in the course materials early or alternatively be used halfway through a course where motivation levels are starting to wane and to help recapture or to loop the students back into their courses. Research also shows that distance learners typically rely on a narrow set of written learning strategies and could benefit from broader strategies or learning experiences, which brings us to our second key area that we think the project has significance for, the potential for using learning activities or devising assessments that have a visual component. Now, we did not specifically tie our flat lecture project to a literacy or a writing task, as would be typical in many high school and primary, primary school flat Stanley projects. Our focus was on getting students to think creatively and to engage in a hobby that they might find enjoyable with the hope that it would have a positive flow on effect for our classes. However, it's not much of a stretch to th think about and to imagine how a photography activity or an assessment item, whether or not it also involves a cartoon avatar such as ours, might support learning in law, and particularly how law or its effects manifest in our societies. A photograph could be used in combination with a reflective or an exploratory writing task or explanatory writing task, excuse me. And if you're interested in this, um, the concept of photo voice, where taking a photograph is used as a way for individuals to reflect, to learn, to talk and to share, could be something that you might look into. Photo voice encourages discussion around our shared experiences and could include experiences of law or how to highlight other things such as social justice issues. So photography activities or assessments could be pitched as critical thinking tasks. And in our opinion, asking students to engage creatively in legal thinking 
aids their development of the skills necessary to become reflective practitioners, but also good problem solvers. And finally, if you're interested in which photograph won our competition overall, it was this entry here, which was titled Point of View, it's dinner time, time to eat some bamboo and drink coffee by our student Tabitha Letlian. So thank you very much and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Donna and Maria. I have to laugh each time I struggle to find the uh, button, <laughs> given we've been doing this for two years. Um, I'm just waiting for some questions to pop up through on the chat. But I found, well, firstly, I just want to say kudos to all you people who had children in primary school and homeschooling and, and teaching, which is worse than having to, you know, do your own research and stuff at home during those lockdowns, because I just, yeah. You know, well done to you all. It was now, something people, else, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I had older teenagers, so that was kind of so hands off. It was easy, but um, and the, yeah, with the teaching and things like that. I think kudos to you guys as well for bringing in something so creative like that. I've been part of a photography competition when I did my PhD, won a prize as well. And I think I'll have to say that my, I was probably the only economics PhD at MIT that had poetry in there between the chapters. So um, I think there's a lot of space for using creative methods. And in fact, Helen Carr has published a book on creative research methods. And I think it gets people to think outside the square, um, not just only in research, but also in teaching. You know, I'm really starting to think about, well, how could you use photography with law students when you're thinking about access to justice and civil rights issues and those kinds of things, you know, so it could really get them to think a bit more creatively about those um, uh, legal issues in the future. We have got a question. So from Queenie Lay, thank you for sharing your interesting project. Will you repeat this exercise in the future? talking about this today whether whether we should do it when we should do it how we would do it on a larger scale etc um in, in my experience this is one of the funnest things that I've done in the last couple of years and seeing what the students came up with and I guess getting to know them a little bit better on that level um you know it was a, it was highly enjoyable but I guess the challenge then is thinking about how you can combine it with a learning activity that links to legal content or in my particular field I, I like setting law and society assessments so yeah I, I would love to scale it up and maybe do an art exhibition or something as a result but it's just really coming down to I guess planning and thinking through um, how we can do this on that larger scale um, and make it, I guess, more deliberately a research project as opposed to an accidental project that worked out great. <laughs> yeah, my, my first uh, little thought bubbles were, oh, I wonder if they assess their um, well-being before and after and, and, and things like that. But I think that, that, you know, the point that you make about um, it having an impact on your own well-being as educators in that scenario when everyone's locked down, when you are talking into the vacuum and you've got minimal interaction and things like that. I think that's really, um, you know, an important outcome as well because that, that's what motivates you and keeps you going. And indeed, you know, it's like in the family, if the leader's grumpy or not happy, everybody else feels it and would affect the mood of the class. Um, yeah, and it's something we don't think about, I think, as educators. We don't reflect on our own energy levels and motivation, which is it, it was an important, I think, talking point for Marie and I as part of doing this. Mm. Mm. Uh, even the fact that it brought us into contact more because we obviously don't live in the same house and we weren't <laughs> hanging out with colleagues, but it brought us together in a way which was really positive and it was just fun sharing the imagery. So, I think actually what's really nice about it is that it was kind of analog, you know, you sent something in the post and I think you know, everyone just had online digital fatigue, you know, yes. and everyone was desperate for some something tactile, something real, you know, and that whole, you know, the post person coming, very exciting. 
I think that's right. It's all about connection. And even yeah. you probably can tell from my accent, I'm not Australian. I arrived in Australia at the beginning of 2020 before the first lockdown. So I actually haven't explored any of these places myself. So it was actually a really nice way for me to get to explore the wider Newcastle region without having, having to leave my own house, which was yeah. which is great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Marie and um, Donna. I think this has been the best session for the past two days. I'm having lots of fun and I think it's very interesting. Now, the next presenter is uh, Esther Archibong, who works in the Department of Legal Matters at the Federal Polytechnic in Nakeda in Nigeria. And her coll colleague, Dr. Annie Fiok Udiofia, also a lecturer at the University of Uyo. So their topic today is on the semantic web technologies in Nigerian universities, faculty of law for e-learning during the um, COVID-19 outbreak. Hello, the moderator, Dr. Jessica Kutin of the Victoria Law Foundation and other presenters. I am Barista Esther Achibong, and I'm here to present a research conducted by Barista Esther Achibong and Dr. Anefia Udofia titled Semantic Web Technologies in Nigerian University's Faculty of Law for e-learning during Omicron SARS-CoV-2 variant outbreak. We conducted this research to examine the availability and utilization of semantic web technologies in Nigerian University's Faculty of Law for e-learning during Omicron SARS-CoV-2 variant outbreak. The research was conducted in the South, South and Southeast geopolitical zones in Nigeria. Because of time constraints, I will give a brief introduction. This research revealed that Nigeria is the most populated country in Africa with an estimate of about 213 million inhabitants. According to Nigeria Center for Disease Control, there are cases of severe acute respiratory syndrome infection in Nigeria which is traced to the virus that caused the coronavirus disease outbreak in late 2019 in Wuhan, China. <clears throat> the Omicron SARS-CoV-2 was actually discovered in Nigeria in October 2021 and was reported to the World Health Organization in November 24, 2021. In November 2021, the 26th of November 2021, the World Health Organization Technical Advisory Group on Virus Evolution proposed that the SARS-CoV-2 variant known as Omicron be identified as variant of concern. The term variant of concern for SARS-CoV-2 refers to viral variants with mutations in spike protein receptor binding domain that improve binding affinity while also causing fast dissemination in human populations. Omicron SARS-CoV-2 variant has affected the lives of many individuals and negatively impacting the global economy and sources of livelihood. As at Saturday 11th June 2022, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control reported 5,198,000 572 tester samples and 256,264 confirmed cases, 3,003 active cases, 250,117 discharge cases, and 303,144 deaths, as well as more than 45 Omicron variant cases. So having realized the negative impact of the pandemic on global economy, the educational institutions woke up facing serious challenges. They had containment issues such as the travel ban, restriction to movement, and closure of schools. They have untold consequences. According to UNESCO, about um, 1,513,000 1,371 university students were out of school in 2020, and 73.8% of the world's school populations were affected by school closure. The Federal Ministry of Education in Nigeria approved the closure of schools on March 19, 2020. This closure led to a lot of a lot of disruptions in educational system in Nigeria, including learning methods, you know, access to schools parenting routines and um, prices 
management capacities of the federal and state ministries of education. Also, considering the challenges facing universities' education as a result of the present pandemic, different universities have come to realize the educational benefits of utilizing internet in the classroom as section of the learning environment. Mark, Mark off of the New York Times in 2006 envisioned the evolution of semantic web and applications which brings aid to the educational system, bearing in mind the need for e-learning tutoring that educators may have to render to their learners. So let's look at the concept of semantic um, web technology. Research revealed that semantic web is the first generation of metaverse which comprises high quality intelligent tutoring system such as we have the videos, have a 3D simulation, we have virtual reality, the wikis, um, limits less bandwidth. Semantic web technologies provide learners with personal settings and different options in education that enhances you know, this feeling of immersion in the computer generated virtual world. Okay, semantic web is a geospatial web where location, please just permit me to read. Semantic web is a geospatial web where location is utilized to index data that can be used for e learning. In semantic web environments, the focus is shifted to the students with self directing and self regulating tools. On this basis, the qualitative characteristics of the web that can be used in the universities are intelligence, personalization, compatibility, and virtualization to operate on big data, related data, cloud computing, um, 3D visualization, and augmented reality. Semantic Web has the ability to aggregate information from multiple sources and establish semantic relationships between all available content to ensure seamless seamless accessibility and searchability and usability thereby eliminating and reducing the need for students to actually sit in a traditional classroom for lectures semantic web supports offline use of of consumption of downloaded data which makes it possible to use information in low bandwidth. Okay, the semantic web technologies mostly used for e-learning includes we have the virtual 3D libraries, um, semantic, semantic blogs, microblogging, virtual worlds and avatars, virtual laboratories. We have intelligent search systems, we have the wikis, we have RSS, which is a real simple um, syndication we have uh, YouTube, we have Skype, Zoom, Encyclopedia, and a lot of many others. The semantic web platforms also allow universities and educators to upload this, their coursework and course content for students quarantined at home to participate in educational progression. Let's look briefly at Nigerian internet utilization experience during the pandemic. Findings of our study revealed that more than 60% of Nigerians were not connected to internet during the pandemic. Therefore, the decision to halt or stop the academic calendar by federal government of Nigeria met unprepared facilities and technologies for e-learning during the pandemic, which could have enhanced effective educational system during the pandemic. The methodology used in the study employed a descriptive survey research design and a randomly um, sampled 150 lecturers out of 324 lecturers in the Faculty of Law from 10 public universities in the South South and South East geopolitical zone to ascertain the level of utilization and availability of semantic web technologies in the universities of Faculty of Law. This instrument used for data collection was a, st a structured questionnaire and the reliability coefficient of the instrument was established um, using Crambach Alpha statistics, which yielded a 
a reliability coefficient of 0 0.92. The findings of this research revealed that the technologies available in all the universities for e-learning are World Wide Web, Zoom, um, YouTube, and Skype. This research further revealed that microblogging, virtual 3D libraries, um, virtual 3D libraries, virtual worlds, and, and avatars. Um, we had the wikis, the Canva, the Logitech, the Class Dojo, the Adobe Spark video, the virtual lab laboratories, the real uh, simple simplification feats, electronic class role, and other semantic web technologies were available in very few Nigerian universities' faculty of law for e-learning during the pandemic. The findings of this study further revealed that only, only worldwide web, Zoom, YouTube, and Skype were utilized in all the university's faculty of law for e-learning during that pandemic. Okay, in conclusion, globally, e-learning using semantic web is seen as is seen as a facilitator, like a catalyst that drives learning. Hence, it should become an integral part of learning in developing countries. The quest for e-learning at this period of Omicron variant outbreak has increased the need for adequate availability and utilization of modern technologies in Nigerian universities. Hence, my humble recommendation. Okay, the federal and states, the federal, the state governments and universities, vice chancellors, and also the director general of the Nigerian law school, even though my topic hasn't captured this, but they should also be a part of it to make available adequate semantic web technologies for e-learning as well as train law lecturers on the utilization of the technologies of e-learning secondly also regular appraisal and upgrading of the semantic web technologies should be carried out thirdly federal state government and universities should connect all universities faculty of law to stable electric grid stable network for effective utilization and this is one of the issues that we have in nigeria stable network they should connect it to if for effective utilization of the semantic web technologies for e-learning okay finally nigerian universities commission should emphasize the utilization of e-learning in faculties of law in their programs for effective educational processing during and after the Omicron. Okay, we've got Jack Berg uh, talking about the use of video for revision in a general education law course. So over to you, Jack. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, transmitting from a hotel room in a very cold Sydney. I wasn't sure <laughs> if this was going to work in terms of the connectivity. So I took the liberty of preparing a pre-recorded um, presentation. So that's going to come on now or fairly soon. And that's why I'm presenting in this way. Um, I, I suppose that's all I need to say for the moment. There, there were some limitations on the project that I'm talking about, which was a series of videos that I produced for the students using guest lecturers. I was hoping at the time to have done a bit more research into the effectiveness on, of them, but as a result of COVID, the course was presented in an online mode. Uh, I had originally intended to produce these videos, which you'll see an excerpt of, uh, in a face-to-face -face program. So my, my object was to produce these as an adjunct. So therefore, I, uh, any, but I, I will discuss some of my proposals for future research. Good, well, without any further ado, 
and noting that, I, I, I was going to say uh, crack a joke, but I don't think it was funny. Uh, so if you could please play this uh, video of my presentation. Thanks very much. Hello, my name is Jack Burke. I'm a senior teaching fellow in the School of Law at City University of Hong Kong. Welcome to this presentation. It will explore the production and use of videos for revision for a gateway education course or general education course, GE as we'll call it. Uh, the course is Citiz Citizens and Criminal Justice, or CCJ. The goal of GE courses is to give students a broad sampling of different academic areas. So this will expose them to varied disciplines, increasing the value and breadth of their undergraduate education. It may also open a range of opportunities for further study or career choice. The aims of CCJ include, firstly, to arouse the curiosity of participants about the fundamental and necessary features of a fair and just system of criminal justice. Secondly, to provide participants with the ability to critically analyse and explain the workings of the criminal justice agencies and institutions, such as the Department of Justice, police and the courts. Thirdly, to provide, by case study and discussion, an understanding of what conduct ought to be labelled criminal. In 2020, I received a Teaching Development and Language Enhancement Grant for the development of CCJ. This was funded by the Hong Kong University Grants Committee. Amongst other things, I decided to produce six videos featuring guest lectures from barristers on various aspects of the subject matter which is part of this course. It should be borne in mind that the budget was relatively limited. A research assistant from the School of Creative Media was hired to co-produce the videos. For example, she took photos of courts and custodial institutions and drew pictures and diagrams. This image features Mr. Kim McCoy. Provision of these graphics, such as photos taken by the RA, helped m remove concerns about copyright issues. The green studio room of City U was used to co-produce the videos. For example, film the presentations of the guest lectures. I wrote the scripts. Overall, CCJ has proved to be successful in teaching evaluations over about the last 10 years, which, according to Cope and others, is not always the, the case in GE courses. However, some comments in CCJ have suggested that not all the content is straightforward for non-law students. As noted by Thompson and others, this is not an uncommon observation for GE courses. Therefore, the content of these videos was primarily directed at reinforcing the substantive knowledge of students, non-law students, across a range of topics taught in the course. 
Consistent with prevailing best practice, the videos were in bite-sized chunks of between six to nine minutes. Also consistent with the increased tendency for students to live and learn online. Use of the video material to disseminate information is not a new concept. However, use of such pre-recorded vehicles for learning allows for collaboration with design and production experts to produce the material and students are able to review the material on multiple occasions. Furthermore, use of videos can, according to Kefsman and others, enhance learning engagement, allow for flexibility in viewing material, and increase performance with embedded quizzes. The topics covered in the videos were Hong Kong's legal system and what a crime is, Hong Kong's police force and powers, courts of Hong Kong, personnel in the Hong Kong court system, sentencing in Hong Kong and the custodial system in Hong Kong. These videos were made available to the students undertaking this course prior to a formative assessment quiz. This quiz allows students to gauge their level of knowledge and understanding of key aspects of the curriculum, especially aspects which are not straightforward for non-law students to comprehend. Please see an excerpt from one of the videos presented by Keith Tan, a practicing Hong Kong barrister, to give you a flavour of these videos. Welcome to part two of this lecture, which concerns the presumption of innocence, the burden and standard of proof, and certain defences to crimes. Please note again that this lecture operates as a very general overview of the course content, and you should read the course lecture notes to supplement my lecture. Starting with the presumption of innocence. It is a fundamental principle, although subject to certain exceptions as set out below, that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. In Wilmington and DPP, the defendant was a farm labourer whose wife had left him. He took a shotgun with him to visit his wife, alleging that he was going to threaten to commit suicide as a means of getting her to come back with him. According to the defendant, the gun went off accidentally, killing his wife. On first instance, the trial judge ruled that the defendant had to prove that the death was an accident for him to be found not guilty of murder. However, on appeal, the House of Lords held that consistent with the presumption of innocence and subject to any exceptions, the prosecution had to prove the guilt of the defendant. The defendant does not have to prove his own innocence. The common law presumption of innocence in Hong Kong has been confirmed by the Privy Council in the case of Kwan Ping Bong. In Kwan Ping Bong, the defendants picked up some jade stones from the airport in Hong Kong. Some of these stones had been hollowed out and had morphine inserted into them. The defendants were charged with trafficking in dangerous drugs. 
simplifying the facts somewhat, it was held by the Privy Council that the defendants were not required to prove that they did not have the knowledge that the drugs were in the jade stones. Rather, the prosecution had this burden and the prosecution's burden was beyond reasonable doubt. This reference to beyond reasonable doubt has been described as the standard of proof. It extends to proof of all the elements of the offence to their standard. It is difficult to state precisely what the standard of proof amounts to. However, a specimen jury direction in Hong Kong provides guidance. The specimen jury direction states, how does the prosecution succeed in proving the defendant's guilt? The answer is, by making you sure of it. The specimen direction further states, nothing less than that will do. If after considering all the evidence, you are sure that the defendant is guilty, you must return a verdict of guilty. If you are not sure, your verdict must be not guilty. It was my intention to conduct a survey of students at the completion of this semester's course on the efficacy of these videos. However, this was predicated on the course being delivered in its usual physical, in-person mode. In other words, as blended learning, which Pistoni has described as students saying it is more effective than just physical, in-person mode or online learning. However, due to the coronavirus, the mode of instruction for CCJ was conducted mainly online. So this would have had implications for the reliability of the survey. Therefore, I decided to defer the survey until the course is completed, primarily in a physical in-person mode, probably next semester. Analytics did reveal a good uptake of watching one of the videos, being the one uploaded to Panopto. So where it was possible to determine this uh, amount of viewing. Also, the results were better than usual for CCJ, as students did very well on a question relating to one of the videos. I will provide a portion of the intended survey for any comments. Here is question one of the intended questions for the survey. Here is question two of the intended questions for the survey. Please feel free to write to me at jasburke at cityu.edu.hk with any suggestions for improvement to these questions. Thanks for your interest and thank you to the Faculty of Law at CUK for arranging this conference. Um. Uh, apologies, there was a H missing um, in the last bit of the message that I thought had been rectified, but but wasn't. So um, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, just a bit of a postscript. Um, subsequent 
to the production of that presentation, I got back my teaching evaluations for this course. And although I've taught in an online mode before, they were the highest results I've ever received for not just that course, but for any course. And although none of the comments in the general comment section either specifically uh, were neither criticized nor uh, gave positive reviews of those videos, one of the questions asked in the TLQs, which was, was this course difficult? Uh, it was the lowest response rate for saying that the course was difficult by a considerable considerable margin, because in, in the past, uh, we, we, all the time, the students had said that the course was too difficult. So perhaps that did, ass did assist in student learning. Uh, as noted, next year, I will uh, provide a separate survey to the usual teaching evaluations or TLQs. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for that, Jack. That was great to see the work that you've done. And um, I'm going to take prerogative of it as a chair to ask some questions. And sure. I'm a bit of a, I'm a serial question pest at conferences. So uh, <laughs> I just hope I can answer your questions. That's no, 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 it's, it's, it's legitimate. So um, I one, and I'm going to give a little bit of a plug for our organisation because part of our organisation is about education and doing a lot of work with year 12 students, so final year students at high schools where they prepare a lot of, um, well, actually do a lot of in-person talks where they get barristers to go to school and judges to go to schools and talk about the legal system and things like that. Because of COVID, they had to pivot and record all those things. But I think what they've done is they've recorded kind of the presentation so they go for half an hour as opposed to what you've done is create a carefully crafted um, um, video there for your students to revise certain aspects of there's not really a question in this but there's a comment certain aspects of sure. your course and I think we've heard from other um, presenters yesterday talking about how the recorded lectures and I've heard that myself with students too that the recorded lectures are better for them, especially if English is not their first language, to slow it down, to listen to it again, and you know, to just um, have that ability to, and even just to transcribe it as well. But in terms of your um, evaluating the effectiveness of it, I don't know what kind of platform you use, whether if it's through your student portal, like a Blackboard or something, I know with ours, I could actually see which students watch that video right, and how many times they'd watched the various videos. So I, if I had a video up there of lecture component, I could see who watched it and who didn't. So then you could go, and then you know the marks that they got at the end of the year, right, in terms of evaluating. So did the kids who watched it and how many times they watched it versus those who didn't, was there a difference in their average mark for those subjects? That's a very good question. I looked at the analytics, and all I saw were just crude numbers. I, I wasn't able, at least with my limited IT skills, to identify who in particular had viewed or not viewed it. But what I will do is, um, based on that very good question, I will go to you know the people who have greater expertise in IT and ask them if I can find out that information because... Yeah, that would be very helpful. And I, yeah, I, I will do that. Uh, thanks yeah, very and, much. Yeah, and, I, and you asked for suggestions. So um, very good I, suggestion. I think what, like with the survey that you have, it's really great to get that kind of feedback. But really what you want is to do some kind of, you know, qualitative co-design stuff, say with students who'd finished the subject, having a look at the videos, what was good, what was bad, what could be improved, what was missing, uh, what what did they not understand? So you really get that kind of um, cognitive assessment of it as you would, for example, if you had a survey instrument or something like that. And I think there's something there in the kind of like using co-design and, and evaluating that to improve or, or change the videos. Because they might say, oh, 
you talked about this subject, but you really missed this component and none of us understood that. That would have been good to have, have that in there. Yeah. So that would be a bit like focus groups, would it? Yeah, but really hands on. So you actually, um, we did it when we developed a website. Um, it had, had to do with economic abuse in young people. And we actually watched them live. Um, you did a, we had to do it by Zoom because again, it was COVID. And then, you know, just asked them questions and got them to think out loud while they were watching it and then discussing it afterwards as well. Yeah, that seems like a very effective measurement. Uh, I, I like the idea of that. I just wish that I had factored that in when I spent the money. And then I don't know if it's ethical, but presumably one way of enhancing engagement is, is to have some sort of um, payment for the students. But, but anyway, I can sort that out. I, I'll speak to the dean and uh, get his permission or seek his or I think his or her permission, depending on her, on who the new dean is, uh, to arrange that sort of research. Could you just give me co-designed? I think was the term. Yeah, that you... fine. So if you kind of use that when you've got the end when you got the end user right. Who's and in this case because you've already developed the instrument. Yeah. And they've done the subject. They've done the exam. Um, they know the information that they needed to know, right? So if you ask them at the start of their subject, do you find this useful? They go, oh yeah, but they don't know what yeah. they don't know yet, right? So Correct. once you've got students that have gone through it all, and then it's about them working together. So you can either do it individually or as a group, basically pulling up, you've got to be a bit tough about it, pulling apart your video and the content and the style and the information to find ways that would either better engage them or improve it, if you if that's what you're looking at in terms of um, version two. Sure, sure. There's probably some others that we can create bec because actually I, I can almost do these without an RA. We, we have the technical support in yeah. the university that can do most of it anyway. Uh, maybe not taking maybe not taking the photographs like of the courts and of the custodial institutions but but it could probably be done without much in the way of funding because of the studio and the personnel and so on but yeah that's an excellent idea and and something that I'll aim to do um after semester b next year so thanks very much for that tip